Hi all, Adam here from the Jacobs Institute, and this video will serve as our training for the Bantam Tools desktop PCB milling machine, formerly known as our other mill. After watching this video and taking the online quiz, you'll be approved to reserve and use one of these handy little CNC milling machines behind me during open makerspace hours. Before we get into learning to use them, let's talk a little bit about what they can be used for and why we might choose machining over, for example, 3D printing. Three axis CNC machines are used for so many workflows in product development from low fidelity to high and to support any volume of part production from individual prototypes to high volume manufacturing. This mini milling machine is capable of cutting most materials softer than steel with some of the most common materials being Delrin, HDPE, aluminum, wood, and wax. Three common workflows that can be accomplished with a CNC are small parts, which might include gears, enclosures, small scale models, nameplates, and much more. Molds, which could be used for room temperature casting of rigid or flexible parts with a wide range of material properties, or even for injection molding at scale, and making printed circuit boards or PCBs, which are the foundation of most electronics design. Learning how to make PCBs is a great way to shrink, simplify, and level up any electronics project. I'm gonna demonstrate the workflows for both PCB milling and traditional machining within this video but longer explorations of these three component types will be reserved for other videos. The main goal of this video is to simply get you the information you need to get onto the machine and to demonstrate why you might want to. Some quick facts about the mill. Its build envelope is five and a half inches wide by four and a half inches deep and supports material up to 1.35 inches thick or 1.6 inches thick, depending on whether or not you have the spoil board installed. The spindle's max speed is 16,400 RPM, and all of the bits we use have a 1 8 of an inch chuck. Our tool library includes bit sizes from 8 inch all the way down to 1 1 hundredth of an inch, and our bit types include flat, ball, and V-shaped end mills. Flat end mills are used for removing bulk material and getting smooth surfaces. Ball end mills are used for 3D contouring, and V-carve end mills are used for engraving and chamfering. You'll need a few things to get started. The first is to reserve time on the machine at reserve.jacobshall.org. As with any CNC, you always wanna book double the amount of time that you think you'll need. You also need to have designed your parts already and generated the CAM files. For this training, I'm going to demonstrate the development of a prototype that uses both PCB milling and traditional milling functions of the other mill. For the PCB portion of our build, we'll create what might be the simplest interactive electrical circuit a battery, a button, and an LED with the appropriate resistor. We'll reserve a deeper exploration of PCB design for a future video, and I'll point to some reference materials in the description, but the high-level takeaway here is that we're aiming to selectively remove copper from the surface of a PCB blank in order to create dedicated pathways electricity must flow through. There are lots of software packages for PCB design, Altium is a big one in industry, but Fusion 360 is free with an educational license and has great integration between CAD, CAM, and electronics design. We can jump into Fusion, click create an electronics design, populate our schematic with a battery, resistor, three millimeter LED, and a small momentary switch. After that's wired using the net command, we can jump over into the board layout and position all of our components closely in relation to each other. We're aiming for a one-sided PCB here for simplicity. We can then create a boundary wire around our components and use the DRC or design rules check to ensure compatibility between our design, our machine, and our tooling. My goal here, again, for simplicity is to have all minimum traces be machinable with a 132nd inch end mill, which will mean I can avoid tool changes entirely. For the sake of demonstration, we use an engraving bit too, but optimizing for time is usually a consideration both during prototyping and manufacturing. After we complete our electronics design fusion, we can push it into a 3D model. This 3D model of our board makes it super easy to design the second demo part for this training, an enclosure for our PCB. We'll machine this out of quarter inch Delrin. While we're here in fusion, let's just go ahead and design that part. Things to think about during the design process are the maximum material thickness available, which in this case will top out at a quarter inch. We also want to consider the diameter bit we're hoping to use, 
which will affect the interior radius of any corners we want to cut. A bigger bit means faster manufacturing and lower chance of breaking bits, but lower resolution features. A smaller bit will increase machining time and add risk and costs through bit consumption. Finally, we can consider whether or not there are any interlocking features that need to be tolerance to either snug or loose fit. Fit will depend on material, but I tend to give parts around half a millimeter of breathing room to avoid binding during assembly. Here, I'm creating a model that has most of the important geometries on one part, with a second part made to press fit in the back. By loading most of the complicated features into one side, we're actually already starting to think in a product manufacturing mindset. If one part can be stamped instead of injection molded, we'll save a lot on cost. With electronics, you'll also think about heat dissipation, access for repairs, water tightness, et cetera. But for our purposes, we can pretty much ignore these considerations. We generated our cam paths starting with an adaptive clearing pass followed by a contour cutout pass. For more information on CAM setup, see our detailed CAM guide on our B courses module, also linked below. Electronics jobs for the Bantam Tools desktop milling machine need to be processed using the built-in CAM processor and can be exported either as Gerber files or as a BRD. Traditional machine files, on the other hand, can be post-processed from the manufacturing environment by individually right-clicking each toolpath, hitting post-process, and using the other plant, other mill post-processor. All other settings can remain default. Turn the machine on with a switch on the back. If the machine doesn't beep or invite you to home it, you may need to rotate the red e-stop button to pop it out. While we have a computer attached to the other mill in the lab that you're welcome to use, my recommendation is that you install the free Bantam Tools software, which can be downloaded from their website on your personal laptop and plug in using USB. That way you can set up nearly everything in advance and don't need to use much of your reserved time on the machine setting up your files. When you arrive at the machine, it should be clean, vacuumed clear of debris and have no bit installed. If this is not the case, it will create an extra burden on your reserved time. So please let a staff member know. If the aluminum spoil board becomes so damaged that it's difficult for you to use, will run a facing operation that will take it down a few tenths of a millimeter to clean it up. This takes about a half an hour, but it's sometimes unavoidable. It's called the spoil board for a reason. We expect it to take some damage over time. If it becomes very damaged while you're using the machine, please let us know so that we can run a facing operation between appointments. On the subject of consumables, do your very best to avoid breaking bits, but we do expect them to break from time to time. And so we try to include two of each of our most used types in our bit case. If you run out, please let us know. We'll probably wanna check your tool paths to make sure you're not trying to run anything too aggressive, but it's an educational machine. And so please don't be afraid to tell us when things aren't going your way. The other machine setup condition that you should take note of is whether or not the machine has a frame already installed. PCB milling operations use the frame both for support and also for high fidelity part flips during two-sided PCB manufacturing. If it's not installed and you want to add it, simply locate it and the two or three screws that hold it in place, attach it with an Allen wrench and run the PCB bracket locating service in initial setup. This will involve taking an eighth inch end mill, inserting it upside down into the machine collet, tightening it down and running a probing routine so that the machine can accurately account for the new bracket placement in software. If you want to remove the bracket, simply unscrew it and select remove under PCB bracket. One last thing to keep an eye on, both before and during machining, is the two O-ring belts that drive the spindle. If one breaks off, you'll need to find a second one to replace it with before continuing your job. In the software, we work pretty much from top to bottom, starting with initial setup to load your files. For our PCB, we're going to load our Gerber files. For material setup, we'll put in the size of our PCB, which is a single-sided F1 board with dimensions of 125 millimeters by 100 millimeters by 1.6 millimeters. Always use calipers to measure to double check. While I'm doing this, I'm going to apply double-sided tape to the back of my PCB. It's important to use enough where the PCB will lift up during machining and likely ruin both the blank and the bit. My favorite tape for this is carpet tape, but if we only have double-sided scotch tape, you can get away with applying it in non-overlapping lines all across the back. 
before hearing it, cleaned the aluminum spoil board of all dust and leftover adhesive from prior operations with an alcohol swab and wait until all the alcohol evaporates before pressing your PCB down firmly. If you care about the look of your PCB, wear gloves as the oils from your fingers will cause the copper to quickly oxidize. Back in the software, we can choose our bit sizes for milling. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to use an engraving bit as well as a 1 32nd inch end mill for the hole and cutout operations. For a single-sided PCB, these will simply occur in order of smallest bit to largest bit. For double-sided PCBs, you'll want to turn off the cutout operation for the first pass to make the board flipping operation easier. The bit holder should only ever be open while you're selecting a bit. The bits are stored pointed upwards and are incredibly thin, sharp, and brittle, meaning they can easily puncture skin and break off inside your left hand's pinky finger and remain there for three to four months. So keep the bit holder closed when not in use. Use the two wrenches on top of the machine to loosen the collet and slip your chosen bit up in before finger tightening the collet closed. Use the wrenches to finish tightening your bit. Most machining issues that will occur come from either improperly generated speeds and feeds or the bit slipping loose during an operation. So tighten it firmly, but not so firmly that you risk stripping the threads on the collet nut. The wrenches should only ever be in your hands or in this upper tray, never on the table, on the floor, or outside on the pavement. You can add one of our spindle fans to clear chips away automatically, or if you can't find a fan, you can machine a new one for yourself. Following the remaining setup workflow, we position our material in the software. I'll even measure the thickness of my tape with the calipers and include it as a material offset in the Z-axis. When placing my toolpaths, I'll also scoot them in from the bracket a few millimeters so I don't run the bit into it, which will break the bit. Once we're ready to go, we need to install the correct bit. The software will tell you when bit changes are necessary, but in the edge case where the last person to use the machine used the same size bit that you just installed, the machine may not know to tell you to set the bit's Z height, and you may end up crashing the machine. So I'll usually do this final step manually. Go to Jog, Install Tool, and follow the prompts. The idea here is that the machine establishes the relationship between the end of the tool, which changes every time you do a tool installation with the bed, and can therefore determine the height of each operation. It does this by creating an electrical circuit between the bit and the bed, meaning that if the collet is dirty or if there's dust or adhesive left on the spore board and the machine is unable to ascertain this electrical circuit, it will continue lowering the bit into the bed until the motor stalls or the bit breaks. As such, whenever I do this operation, I keep my hand on the red e-stop button, just in case I hear a grinding noise and need to stop the machine, clean the bed, and restart the z-height finding operation. Once you've found your Z0, you're pretty much good to go. Hit machine all and watch the mill do its thing. If something is going to go wrong, like the stock lifting up or moving around or the bit diving into the scoreboard, it's most likely gonna happen in the first few seconds of machining. So I'll also keep my hand near the e-stop for that as well. When cleaning up after machining fiberglass PCBs, which is the only time fiberglass is permitted on the machine, be incredibly careful not to inhale the dust, which is toxic. Many of the steps for traditional milling are similar to those described earlier in PCB manufacturing. We're going to load our file similarly, input the size of our stock similarly, and position the toolpath similarly. Some differences occur during fixturing. I personally like leaving the bracket on and using it to prevent clockwise rotation of my stock, but if you need more room, you can remove the bracket, and if you need even more room, you can remove the spoil board and use bolts and clamps to fix your material to the ways. For aggressive toolpaths in tall material, you may also want to add secondary holding methods, like a bead of hot glue around the edge. For soft materials, light cuts or thin stock, work holding beyond double-sided tape may not be necessary. Once we've loaded our toolpaths and checked our work, we can load the proper tool into the chuck and perform our Z-zeroing operation. Let's go ahead with the cut. You must remain near the machine while it's cutting your part and be ready to hit the e-stop if anything sounds like it's going wrong. Once you're done, vacuum out the machine, remove and put away the bit, and clean the spoil board with an alcohol pad. 
Leaving the machine better than you found it will ensure that the next user is able to stay within their reservation time. With careful planning, the Bantam Tools desktop milling machine can be used to level up any prototyping project. If you have any questions about the machine or workflows for making PCBs or small parts, please reach out to our design specialist staff. At this point, you can proceed to the online quiz and then the reservation page. Safe milling and see you in the makerspace.